Welcome to the next video in the Patterns in Nature topic. This video will be looking at the two dot points, identify that there is movement of molecules into and out of cells, and describe the current model of the membrane structure and explain how it accounts for the movement of some substances into and out of cells. So in the previous video, we looked at what different substances are required by cells. So now we're going to have a look at how those substances get into and out of the cell and how the cell membrane impacts on that movement. So molecules are continually moving into and out of cells. So raw materials are needed for things such as photosynthesis and respiration, and the waste that are produced need to be expelled. So they need to leave the cell to be taken to the organs that are able to excrete them. Otherwise, if they build up too much, then they can cause damage to the overall functioning of the organism. So the cell is continually also exchanging materials with its external environment. So oxygen comes in, glucose comes in, carbon dioxide goes out, water goes out. So the cell membrane is the uh, organelle of the cell that completely surrounds the outside. It, so it forms a barrier around the outside of the cell and helps to contain all of the cell contents within it. It is referred to as semi-permeable or selectively permeable. So this means that compounds such as water can easily move into and out of the cell, but larger molecules such as polysaccharides cannot. So you remember that we talked about polysaccharides being things like glycogen that are large molecules that are unable to move across the, uh, the, the cell membrane, so they're unable to move into or out of the cell. So the current model for the cell membrane is known as the fluid mosaic model, and this represents the structure of the cell membrane. So as we can see here, our cell membrane is two layers. So it's made up of the same structures on the outside as, as, as on the inside. Okay, and these are referred to as phospholipids. Okay, so phospho meaning that they have a phosphate group attached to them, and then the lipid meaning that they have obviously a fats or an oil group attached to them. So what we have is here we have this structure where the hydrophobic ends, so the tails, the hydrophobic tails all face the middle of the cell membrane and all the hydrophilic heads face the outside. So hydrophilic means water loving and hydrophobic means water hating. So all of the hydro sorry, the hydrophobic, so the water-hating parts face into one another and the water-loving bits face either the outside of the cell, which is the extracellular fluid, or the inside of the cell, which is the intracellular fluid, which is made up mostly of water. So what we have here is a simplified version of the cell membrane. As we can see, we have our phospholipid structures on either side of the cell membrane okay so we have our hydrophobic um, tails towards the middle our hydrophilic heads towards the outside or the inside of the cell so amongst these hydro uh, sorry these um, phospholipids we have a number of different other molecules or uh, components that help to make up the actual cell membrane structure and provide it with the number of functions that it requires so the first ones are integral proteins. So as we can see from the picture here, these proteins completely penetrate the lipid bilayer. So they run all the way from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell where the cytoplasm is. And basically what they do is they control the entry and removal of specific molecules. So different molecules will be allowed to come in, pass through the whole protein and travel into the cytoplasm and then vice versa. Okay, so these proteins will detect different molecules and allow certain ones in and out. The next one are our uh, channel proteins. So they're similar to our integral proteins. So these also penetrate the lipid bilayer and some substances, particularly ions and carbohydrates, are transported via these channels. So remember we said that um, carbohydrates can be too big to pass through and then ions will need to travel against a concentration gradient. So when we start having a look at transport across the membranes, we'll have a look at the fact that most of them travel from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So what this channel in particular here does is if the concentrations are different on either side of the uh, membrane, it'll allow the ions to move quite freely. <laughs> 
Then we have these peripheral proteins. So these peripheral proteins are stuck to the outer surface of the membrane. And basically what they're involved in is communication between the cells. So if cells are touching one another, these peripheral proteins detect that and then stop the cell from multiplying. So this is really important when it comes to uh, times where mitosis is happening quite a bit and the cells are reproducing. If the cells reproduce uncontrollably, then we can have uh, issues like cancer and tumours growing because those cells just keep dividing without realising that there's actually not enough room for them all. Next we have cholesterol. So cholesterol is found in amongst the phospholipids and what that job or what their job is to do is to disturb the close packing. So if the phospholipids were uh, too closely together, the cell membrane wouldn't have that real fluid motion that it requires in order to be able to change its shape and be allowed, be able to uh, transport those substances in and out. Cholesterol also helps to maintain the stability of the cell. And lastly, glycoproteins, which aren't on here, but they're another type of proteins that have a carbohydrate molecule attached. And they're also involved in cell recognition. They're also involved in the immune response and immune receptors. So basically what we mean by that is every cell in our body has a uh, sort of a signal on the outside that says, this is our cell, this belongs to this body, don't attack it uh, if there is an issue with where the immune response needs to take place. So those glycoproteins just help the body to know what's ours and what's not. And also the glycoproteins help to stabilize membrane structure. So the currently accepted model for the structure of the membrane is known as the fluid mosaic model. And basically what that means is that the double layer of lipids is thought to be quite fluid. So when we think of something that's fluid, we think of something that flows. So unlike the fixed walls of a house, the cell membrane, plasma membrane, is able to change its shape and move quite freely. So molecules in the cell membrane, such as the proteins and glycoproteins that we saw in the previous slide, they can change their place up to 10 million times per second. And that's because of this fluid fluidity within the movement of the cell. So basically, biologists refer to the structure and movement of the cell membrane as fluid. Okay, so that refers to the movement of the cell membrane and mosaic, which refers to the different parts that make it up, including the proteins, carbohydrates, and the phospholipid bilayer. So as part of the dot point, we also need to be able to have a look at the movement and account for why particular movements take place in uh, around the cell membrane. So we have two different types of transport that take place across our cell membrane. First is passive transport and the second is active transport. So passive transport is movement that requires no energy. So if we say somebody is passive aggressive, they're not really overly overtly aggressive. They're just sort of, uh, you know, they sly comments and things like that. So they're not actually putting much effort in. So there's three different types of passive transport that we'll be looking at uh, in a little bit more detail in the coming lessons, and they are diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. So diffusion is the movement of substances such as oxygen through the membrane from a high concentration of oxygen to a low concentration of oxygen. Osmosis also involves diffusion, but in particular it is the diffusion of water molecules, specifically from an area where there is lots of water to an area where there's not much water, across the semi-permeable membrane. So we've mentioned this term a few times now, semi-permeable membrane. So this simply means osmosis is the movement of water into and out of the cell. And lastly, facilitated diffusion is the diffusion of substances into the cell, but not directly through the phospholipid layer. So these substances diffuse through integral proteins in the cell membrane that we had a look at. So up here in this little image we can see diffusion here where substances simply move across the cell membrane from an area where there's lots to an area where there's less. Here we have facilitated diffusion so again we're moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration but this time we're doing so through a integral protein channel.
So the other type of movement is active transport. So some molecules cannot pass through the cell membrane at times because of a number of different properties. Whether they're too big, they may be stopped by the diffusion gradient, as I said before. Um, if we end up with substances moving in or out of the cell and changing the concentration to being too high or too low, we won't have diffusion take place naturally. Or they may carry an electrical charge. So ions, as we said earlier as well, won't be able to move across the cell membrane on their own. So specific carrier proteins bind to these molecules and bring them inside the cell. So here we can see that this molecule here fits perfectly in the shape of this carrier protein here. So what happens is this will bind here. It will cause a reaction inside the carrier protein. This side will open and allow the molecule to move inside the cell. So this also happens both ways, both to move substances into and out of the cell. So the big difference, however, between passive transport and active transport is passive transport does not require energy, where active transport does require energy, usually in the form of ATP, which we know is created by respiration, so in the mitochondria. So that brings us to the end of this video. And from this, we'll be doing two investigations to have a look at how the semi-permeable membrane of the cell membrane acts in a number of different ways. Thank you.